I'm Zoe. Uh, I'm one of the Sequarists with Sequari Ocean Education. Um, we're, we're out here today in the backyard behind the West Wind Lab and we're talking about seaweeds, things that you might commonly find in the intertidal zone here on the south corner of Vancouver Island in around Victoria. Behind you here is Yogi Kalisville and he is... Oh. Um, who, who are you, Yogi? Introduce uh, yourself. I live in the backyard here. <laughs> <laughs> Under the fig tree. Yes, lovely. Every now and then people come by and ask me about seaweeds. <laughs> So unlike trees, which have roots, uh, most seaweeds will have something we call a holdfast. And so this is the holdfast of uh, the winged kelp. Um, and what this does is it kind of stretches out. You can see it has these almost little like foot-like appendages, and those will grip the rock and hold the seaweed fast to the substrate. They don't do any of the things that a um, tree's roots would do, like take up minerals and nutrients from the soil or store and hold sugars over a winter um, because all of that is able to happen because the whole seaweed is submerged underwater through its blades. Um, and so you can see this winged kelp has a single stipe that runs through the whole body of the plant um, and down at the bottom it has these patches that are reproductive so they have the sporophytes, these dark areas that will fall off and produce the spores that will move to the next generation of the plant. So this is Costario castata, the sea cabbage, and you can see here that's its hold fast. And these are the palms. So this is another type of kelp we have called the feather boa kelp. And so even though this is one singular plant, and so you can see this is the area I had to cut it off before the hold fast, but that would have attached to the floor, but it has multiple different blades, and so all of these um, are part of the same plant. And so this is called the feather boa kelp, um, and that is, you know, for its remarkable likeness to a feather boa. When you're on the beach, if you need a fancy dress in a pinch, you can always just throw it on and uh, makes for great party clothes, the feather boa kelp. Yes. Egregious. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the reasons why feather boa kelp grows so long is that it's able to resist being snapped in half by the waves by just kind of flowing with them. Uh, Today is a relatively low exposure day, so you can kind of just see the gentle swaying of them. Um, but when waves are breaking in this little cove, that's going to be one of the things that keeps them intact. This is sea lettuce, um, Ulva, I assume, Lactica. Um, and it is really abundant this time of year. So if you go out into the intertidal zone of your beaches on a low tide, you'll see this kind of spread everywhere. Um, and so this is one of the kind of early, early abundant growers on the coastline. And the huge um, boom in the growth of the sea lettuce that we're seeing is because our days are getting a lot longer and our ocean is warming up. So it's kind of the uh, best time for all the sea lettuce is uh, quite delicious for us to eat as well and um, you know you dry it up or you can eat it fresh if you like um, and uh, in some places uh, like in uh, Wales and Ireland I believe they let the cows graze on the beach at low tide at, in Tofino there's a few cows who do it on one of the islands off of Vargas Island so Today. I've heard there's cows that eat sea That's lettuce. right, and you actually see deer out there um, chewing on it as well. And as, as we know, um, cows, they have bacteria in their guts, which uh, help in the digestion. And it turns out that the, those bacteria produce a lot of methane, which is one of our major greenhouse gases. So we add up all the methane being produced by cows in the world. It is a very significant portion of you know, the global warming problem that we have. And it turns out that if you feed them ulva, you know, sea lettuce together with other things, their methane production drops dramatically. Mm. And so this is one of the solutions maybe to a greenhouse gas and we can still gobble up hamburgers and, <laughs> eat and drink milk. This is um, an iridescent seaweed. It's a type of red seaweed. Um, we sometimes know it as maziella. Uh, and so this you'll see, uh, it's quite um, distinct because of that iridescent shine. So 
um, when you're out on the beach you might peer in the water and see this kind of sparkly bluey purple um, that's what that is and so the red seaweeds kind of are whereas you see a green green seaweed higher up in the intertidal zone you'd see a red seaweed lower down um, so on a really low tide day is when you're likely to see seaweeds that are this color the first time that I saw this at the beach my first thought was that it looks almost like it had got some oil spilled on it or some gasoline spilled on it because of the iridescence um, and it's not the case at all it's just a natural part of how this seaweed grows and how it's built some of the seaweeds especially the red ones um, you find different forms which are really quite fine and filamentous and um, this one here is called microclavia it doesn't really have a common name and in general people probably lump it all together as filamentous reds um, this one here is quite common uh, also in the intertidal, maybe in the mid-intertidal or on the rocks. And you see other kinds of these filamentous growing on other things, other seaweeds and um, tube worms and that kind of stuff. Here's one that's a little bit finer. Um, and these are tiny little filaments that are all growing together in um, uh, red algae. And certain times of the year you'll find them on the bull kelp, for example. A certain particular zone of the bull kelp has a fine red algae growing on it. Now they look a little bit like hair or something. But if you put them in the water and you spread them out nicely, <coughs> they um, are very nice as Christmas cards. On here, this is called the pepper um, weed. And it's another filament, somewhere in between a filamentous and a bladed one. And if you chew on it, it's got a little peppery taste to it. Another red alga that um, is quite common in the intertidal. Um, it's in the low, grows in the low intertidal and washes up quite a bit. It's really bumpy, and so it's called uh, Turkish towel algae. And you can, when you dry it up, it's actually used to, as a scrub, you know, for your in your shower. Well, maybe not so much in the shower, but after the shower to. Um, Exfoliate. Exfoliate, that's it. What's interesting about this is that uh, they also, those little bumps, they also grow, are the places where the reproductive spores grow. And this one in particular, when you look through it, you can see the dark spots, which are where, where the reproduction is happening. And uh, now you'll see those dark spots as well in that iridescent seaweed that we were just looking at. Um, at some times of the year, which is where the seaweed is um, producing seeds in a sense, which will um, germinate not as the same uh, alga, but uh, form of the alga, but maybe some other kind. So, uh, for example, this one, uh, the other phase of its life is an encrusting um, seaweed, which is grows as kind of a, a paint on the, looks like a paint on the rocks. So here we are in the kind of mid-intertidal as the tide is slowly going out at Macaulay Point. Um, and in front of me is a rock covered in pyropia, also known as nori. So this is a very thin um, single blade that grows attached to the rock and you know the hold fast is just a tiny little attachment point um, and this stuff is edible i probably wouldn't eat it here 